would have never guessed you'd come from Florida only in North Carolina only to be hit by a hurricane here in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's coming up. But hey, we're about to go off the edge, so you might want to get your cameras ready. Get yourselves ready. If you're not ready, you better get ready because it's happening. We're going off the edge now. <laughs> All right, big countdown. Hold on to your stomach. Ready? Three, yeah. two, one. Whoa! 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 <laughs> Woo! <laughs> beautiful. Oh, man. Man, oh, man. Hey, welcome to Grand Canyon, you guys. Wow, wow, wow. Definitely a different perspective up here, brother. Yeah, a little bit, huh? <laughs> Down below is the Colorado River. It's uh, certainly one of the longest canyons in the country. It begins up in Rocky Mountain National Park near Denver, and it flows about 1,500 miles to Mexico where it empties into the Sea of Cortez, kind of down near Rocky Point. Down on the left, if you look almost straight down, Andrew, you should be able to see, Carrie. Um, you can see some boats there parked on the side of the river. We'll probably see more boats as we fly along. Just be on the lookout. Um, usually they're just little tiny colorful specks down there. Um, people do whitewater rafting expeditions down Grand Canyon all the time, but it takes anywhere from a week to a month to do the entire 277 mile trip. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty long, uh, pretty big adventure. I think the average time is 10 to 14 days on the river. That's right. Yep, that's the north rim. And we're going to make our way over there in a kind of a roundabout way um, here in a little bit. So on the right is is still the south rim, but te technically they call it the east rim as it turns, as the canyon turns north here. Um, so kind of in front of us would be considered the east rim or the east side of the canyon. Colorado River Canyon, uh, the River Gorge, that we're going to actually kind of fly over to it and cross it. Um, you won't be able to see where he did that. It's like way to the east out near Cameron, where the canyon's really shallow and narrow. But uh, yeah, it's that canyon. Don't let that. No, no. It's like anytime any of those kind of stunts are done, it's not actually the Grand Canyon. It's always the Little Colorado because uh, the Park Service would never allow that stuff to happen. So they do it out on the reservation right now. Pay for that, you know. 
Uh, but they typically do it out in Little Colorado. That's where that Nick Walenda walked a tightrope about five years ago. It was, I can kind of point out where that was. We'll be pretty close to that site. But yeah, I mean, Grand Canyon is just enormous. Um, it's hard to fathom just how big it is. It's, the crazy thing is it's not actually the biggest canyon in the world. It's the longest canyon in the world, 277 miles, but there's bigger canyons out there, deeper, wider canyons. Um, just not, none of them are as epic looking as this, as dramatic. But the park, Grand Canyon National Park, is about 1,900 square miles. That's the same size as the state of Delaware. So, pretty big. And we're going to start our turn to the right. We're going to actually fly over these cliffs. From the river to the rim, those cliffs are about 4,000 feet tall. That's about three times taller than the Empire State Building. So just to try to give you some sort of scale to work off of, you know. At the lowest point of the canyon to the highest point of the canyon, how many miles is it? It's like uh, just vertically? Yeah. Um, it's just a little over a mile. Yeah. Deep, yeah. Close to 6,000 feet. So on our left, you can see the confluence where the Little Colorado River Gorge, this canyon from right to left, comes in and joins the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River. Um, the water is a, kind of a milky color because of minerals in it. Um, you can't really drink that water, it's like so mineralized. But it's kind of cool to see, it almost looks like a paint spill. And, and if you were to go upstream, the canyon gets really dramatic, the Little Colorado. Um, over 2,000 feet deep and not even 1,000 feet across in a lot of places. I think if it was anywhere else in the country, you'd probably plan a trip to see it, but I think it's just overlooked because it's next to Grand Canyon. You know? That's a pretty impressive canyon. Now beyond the Little Colorado is the Painted Desert. You can see the colors kind of popping out there. That's why it's called that. All of that is the Navajo Indian Reservation, which is the largest reservation in the U.S., 27,000 square miles. That's the same size as South Carolina. So, big place. Only about 170,000 people live out there, though, so it's mostly desert wilderness. Definitely more sheep, cattle, and horses than people, by far. <laughs> That's the little, yeah, the little Colorado River Gorge. Now, it's not at its like peak um, for color. It's uh, about three days ago, it was still running red from the uh, Painted Desert because of some storms draining you know, down through. But in another, if you give it another couple weeks when things start to dry out, that water will be like milk white. And wherever there's a deep pool, it'll be, it'll be turquoise color because the way the light, the sunlight filters through that milky water. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, up until a couple days ago, it was so red and muddy that when it met the Colorado River, it changed the color of the Colorado to brown instantly. Like, the rest of it was just brown.
so right now we're actually flying towards the north rim now. And uh, you'll notice just how much higher the north rim is than the south rim. If you look kind of out to the right, you can see the layers almost bending upwards to meet the north rim. The reason why the north rim's higher, the whole Kaibab plateau is higher, is because of an active fault line that we can actually see right now. We're going to fly right over this thing. Um, so starting on the left, just on the right side of this mesa, you can see the rock layers are vertically oriented. And then it kind of cuts in front of us as a jagged spine of rocks um, and then continues on to the right. This fault line is actively pushing the north rim up all the time. They say at a rate of the thickness of a sheet of paper every 100 years. So we come back in a 1,000 years, we aren't exactly going to be shocked by how different it looks, but it will be different, right? When we're right above it, you can look right down into it. It's kind of, kind of crazy. Most of the time, the Colorado River gets all the credit for carving out Grand Canyon. But without this fault line, now we're flying right over it. You can see it extending out beyond us. Yeah. Um, without this fault line, the canyon would have never become as wide as it is. And we can really see what it would have looked like um, out straight ahead, kind of to the right. You can see the canyon suddenly narrows down and then it continues on, right? We got green on both sides. That's where the fault line stops influencing the width of the canyon. So the canyon would still be pretty awesome, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be nearly as vast and massive without this fault line. Chris, are there days when the uh, wind is so strong you cannot fly? Yep, yep. What, what's the cutoff there? What, what does it have to be? It's typically 35 knots. Um, 35 knots and uh, usually a 15 knot gust spread, you know? So if it's like um, 19 gusting 35, then we'll cancel it. What it just gets too punchy. The, the aircraft can handle it. The aircraft is totally fine. It's just not that much fun to go on a tour when it's that bumpy out. <laughs> That's when the, the souvenir bags come out, <laughs> the white ones. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> but what about rain and lightning? Hold on just a second here. Um, so like, well, light rain is fine, yeah. I mean, even heavy rain is fine. It's just not, doesn't make for a good tour. We avoid lightning, you know, like the plague. Oh yeah. That's not cool. <laughs> I don't like lightning. So yeah, if, you know, a little bit of rain, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, it's just heavy rain, we don't like that. Heavy, heavy snow, you know. I think days like this where the, where a storm is moving in is some of the best flying you can have. I mean, like over the canyon, the sky is dramatic, the lighting is dramatic. It's, uh, you know, it has scenery that you don't normally get to see with Grand Canyon because usually it's like bluebird sky, sunny Grand Canyon, you know, and it's nice when we have a little bit of weather to look at. It's absolutely beautiful, no doubt. Now, one of the largest uh, flying birds on Earth lives here in Grand Canyon, the California condor. Their wingspan is upwards of 11 feet. This helicopter from door to door is six and a half feet. So they're a bit bigger than this helicopter is wide. And in the early 80s, there were only 22 condors left. They were nearly extinct. Some zoos in California caught the remaining 22 and started breeding them and releasing them into the wild. Arizona's lucky enough to have one of the five release sites, those red cliffs over there to the right, out in the distance with the million cliffs. They're still releasing condors every year from those cliffs. And now there's over 500. Approximately 75 live here in Grand Canyon on any given day. Do you ever see them when you're flying? While flying, I've seen three. Three in about 800 laps, so... <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I don't really like seeing them when I'm flying. <laughs> They're so big, you know. Must look like a pterodactyl. Oh yeah, or like a small airplane. It's 
they're they're massive. When you're at the south rim, walking around on the rim, uh, be on the lookout because they're actually pretty common over there. You're looking for an enormous black bird with white markings under their wings. They're pretty hard to miss if you do see one because they're hilariously larger than any other bird around. Almost makes you glad when you see one. Makes you glad they're not predatory. You know, <laughs> they're just a big giant vulture. There is wildlife that lives in the canyon as well. Bighorn sheep and mule deer are the predominant large animals that live here. And then wherever there's sheep and mule, and mule deer in the southwest, there's gonna be mountain lions. So there's a real robust population of those three in the canyon. And then all the usual desert critters, um, anything from uh, coyotes to skunks and rabbits to the creepy crawlies that you find in the desert, giant centipedes, tarantulas, scorpions, rattlesnakes, all that stuff. Is there a name for this rock here to the right? That's Mount Hayden. That's probably one of the most popular peaks to climb in Grand Canyon, mostly because of its proximity to a parking lot, which is over there on the rim to the right of it. It actually gets done quite a bit. I think as far as uh, Grand Canyon standards go, it's really easy to get to the base of it. You know, it's not like a multi-day hike to get to it. But as far as any other standards go, it's impossibly difficult to get to the base of that thing. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, it does get done quite a bit. Here in just a moment, we're going to start climbing out of the canyon to go explore the North Rim. But keep in mind, I haven't changed altitude since we went off the edge back there. So that'll really illustrate just how much higher the North Rim is. On average, about 2,000 feet higher. Make sure you get high enough, brother. <laughs> it's in my best interest, too. <laughs> I'm right there with you. This here on the left is called Brady's Peak, but us pilots all call it the battleship. It even has waves that it's sitting on. Isn't that cool? It looks like red dirt, but it's actually a pretty hard substance, it, correct? It is, yeah. I mean, you could dig into it, you know, like with a with a pick or something, but but yeah, it's, it's almost like uh, walking on ball bearings or something. It kind of comes off in little bits. It's pretty compact. Sandstone? Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a sandstone. Welcome to the North Rim, you guys. You just saved about five hours of driving by going on this helicopter ride, so pretty good choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you guys really timed, timed it just right with the uh, fall colors up here. The aspens are going off right now. Lots of yellows and oranges. Don't really expect to see that when you visit Arizona. Because of the higher elevation, the north rim gets, it's a lot cooler, and then it gets a lot more uh, precipitation and snow. On average, they'll get uh, like 10 to 15 feet of snow in the winter up here. They don't even plow the, the road, they just shut it down.
Oh, that's gorgeous. Beautiful. That's up. Aspen trees are one of the largest living organisms on Earth, so a good majority of these uh, stands of aspen trees are connected as literally one plant. And that's how they made it through that fire about 10 years ago. Light strike caused it, burned everything in its path, but luckily the aspen tree's root system was left intact, so that's all it took for them to send them to the shoots. When was the road built? Oh man, I have no idea actually. That's a good question. I would imagine, I would imagine if these roads have been in here since the, the 40s or 50s, I would guess, you know, at least. Because there's a lodge on the north rim that's been there for a long time. Definitely since the early uh, 1900s, so. Oh wow. Yeah, part of why Grand Canyon became a national park was because Teddy Ro Roosevelt came um, to the North Rim on a hunting trip and just felt like this place needed to be completely preserved. So it's pretty cool. And I was back, you know, multi-day horseback ride in here. Now, sometimes we get lucky. Oh, today we're lucky. Cool. There's um, uh, some American bison here on the left hanging out in this meadow. They're kind of hard to see because it looks like they're all bedded down. You can see a few of them up against the trees there. Little black, they look like rocks almost, big black rocks. <laughs> yeah, they're not really in the best spot. They're not out feeding today. They didn't get the memo that we were coming flying. Are they, are they laying down or are they standing up? Yeah, there's some more right there, actually. They're all hanging out in the shade. Must oh, be yeah. One down there. Oh, here's some on the road on the left. Yeah, I see them. These bison were brought here about 100 years ago. They're not actually native to the region. Uh, but the Park Service keeps them around to help just keep a genetic, like a, a genetic diversity a little bit, like a, a gene pool sitting here, just in case, you know, they want to repopulate places in the U.S. with bison. Um, and they kind of keep the herd right about 500. They do really well up here, but just at a certain point, they're detrimental to the native uh, wildlife here. They just eat so much. <laughs> if we continued flying straight for an hour, we would be in Las Vegas. But we're going to turn left and head back to the South Rim, crossing the widest part of the canyon, 18 miles across here.
recently had a geologist on board who told me that when that rock layer was formed, there wasn't even oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere yet, so it's pretty old stuff. And the fact that we can see all of those layers is what makes Grand Canyon so special. Um, like I said before, there are bigger canyons in the world. China has a much bigger canyon, Mexico has a bigger canyon, but they're older canyons and they've eroded to the point that they're not nearly as impressive looking. A lot of them look more like heavily forested valleys, whereas Grand Canyon's so young but all the layers are still very much intact, making it just fantastic for us as visitors to look at. It's to see all those layers, all the colors, each one telling a story.